So now we're going to <clears throat> discuss other federal requirements. Um, and most of these cross-cutting requirements are going to apply to all of the CPD programs. So whether you also implement HOME, whether you implement ESG, whether you implement HOPWA. <coughs> Excuse me, my, after half a day of talking, uh, yeah, I'm losing my voice. Um, so it applies to all of the CPD programs, okay? And again, we're, <clears throat> if you think we were providing a bird's eye view, this is again the 747 view of other federal programs, okay? And again, the important part that we want you to take from this is to know that these things are ap apply to CDBG when they apply to CDBG, okay? Um, with these other federal requirements, we're basically going to take what usually will is five weeks worth of training, okay? Yeah, and condense it, just give you the summary into 45 minutes, okay? Uh, so as you can see, environmental review, for example, which are the, the majority of the slides that we have, we're probably going to spend a good 10, 15 minutes on it. That's a five-day course just an environmental review, okay? Um, yeah, IDIS is a two-day training, uh, so, but be aware that there are opportunities. Hopefully, they'll continue to provide on-site or training, physical training that you can attend. I know that there are some IDIS trainings that are being scheduled, and they're probably already happening throughout the country, right? Um, you can't find them? Yeah, so make sure you go into Resource Exchange and get on their, their uh, list to receive any notifications. Because I know I've mentioned today to a couple of people that next week there will be a tiered environmental review webinar. It's on the 9th. May 11th, May 11th it is? 1 o'clock. Okay. Yeah. And so, you know, you should all be receiving these emails saying we've got this webinar it's going to happen, okay? So sign up on listserv and get these, these notices, and that way you know that trainings are going to happen, okay? <clears throat> so what, which other federal requirements are we going to review? We're going to go through the Environmental Review. We'll go through Uniform Relocation Act, Davis-Bacon and Other Labor Standards, Lead-Based Paint, Fair Housing and Equal Opportunity, and we'll go through OMB, which actually we've already covered through the financial uh, module. <clears throat> Important that you understand that when you spend $1 of CDBG money, you've infected the entire project. It now all has to comply with the CDBG requirements, it must comply with the other federal requirements, okay? Um, there are a few exceptions. I mean, it's, it, it infects the project. It may not necessarily trigger it, like with Davis-Bacon, uh, but know that the second you spent $1, suddenly it is applicable uh, to that particular activity, okay? So let's start with the environmental review. The most important thing that you can take from environmental review is you do not spend a dollar and you do not commit a dollar until you have completed your environmental review for that activity, okay? Quite often, this is one of the, the findings that is made and one of the reasons that grantees are returning funds. It's because they did not do their environmental review on a timely basis. They had already started spending money without having this process being completed, okay? Um, so the environmental review process looks at projects for impacts on the environment impacts from the environment and notifies the public of these findings. And we have some resources that you can go into. It's under, the regulations are all under part 58, okay? So once the applicant applies for HUD assistance, the project then becomes 
federal, okay? It's a federal funded project. And HUD restrictions at Part 5822 now apply, which is why you have to go through the full environmental review process. Uh, neither applicant nor partners in the process are allowed to spend or commit funds. So even though you are uh, working with some partners, subrecipients, et cetera, they cannot you know, commit the funds until that environmental review process has been completed. Very important. Activities that are exempt or categorically excluded and not subject to 58.5 may proceed once the uh, determination is documented. And the reason that it, it kind of isolates that group is <clears throat> these are the two categories in which you technically don't need to do a request for release of funds. You don't need to get HUD approval on it because your end result is that it was categorically excluded, not subject to, okay, or exempt. And so once you've completed that, you document your file, your, your environmental review record, and you can now proceed, okay. An important item on here, does everybody have a certifying official? Do you know what a certifying official is? It's usually your city manager. Your city manager can assign delegation or delegate somebody uh, for the lower tiered environmental reviews because that certification basically is saying that the city is assuming all responsibility for the accuracy of that environmental review, okay? the five-day environmental training and was told under no circumstances should anyone but the city manager, administrator, whoever sign that document. Under exempt or excluded, normally it is permitted. Yeah. Yeah, we do it all the time because the city managers are not always available to sign documents, and especially when you have, you know, a lot of rehab projects that are going on and you're doing the tiered environmental, you need somebody to sign that you know, you can do it that way. Um, but check with your own environmental review officer, okay? And so most of the time when we talk about environmental review, we're talking about working with your environmental review officer and not so much your, your HUD rep, okay? Every field office has an environmental review officer, okay? So we look at uh, project aggregation when we're doing our environmental review. You must group together and evaluate it as a single project. And there are basically two types of aggregation. We have a functional aggregation and we look at a geographic aggregation. So let's take the functional aggregation where we know that a project is going to be completed in phases, okay? Phase one of this community center is a senior center wing. It's going to be something else. Phase two, which is going to happen a year from now, is going to be you know, the youth center. And then phase three is going to be the toddler room, which is like four years away. You can't look at just the project, the, the portion you're going to fund right now, which is the, the senior portion you have to look at the aggregate. What is the entirety of the project when you do your environmental review, okay? And of course, it's to the best of your knowledge because quite often, you know, you have some schematic designs, but by the time the final designs for that, the um, toddler section is done four years from now, it could be completely different. Uh, but each time that you are going into the next phase, you go back and re-examine your environmental review to make sure that it's still applicable and, and revise it as, as necessary, okay? We also look at the geographic uh, aggregation. So that means that if you're doing um, new construction, uh, well, let's not use new construction. Let's say that you're doing multiple projects. You're, mo you're using you're doing multiple streets in a specific area. Uh, you're not doing the environmental review on each individual street. Because you are doing it all within a small area, you're gonna do the environmental review on the aggregate because as a whole, 
they're going to have a different impact than individually, right? As an aggregate, they may have a larger impact. So they want you to do it on the aggregate level, okay? So don't just pick the part that, that is CDBG funded as is listed on, on the slide. Look at the entirety of the project. So these are the, the <clears throat> typical act, uh, um, classifications for environmental review. And so <clears throat> for those of you who use uh, acronyms all the time, we do the CENST, CEST, EA, EIS. Um, it goes from most difficult to most impactful, okay? Least difficult to most, most or less, least impactful to most impactful. Exempt is activities such as administration. <clears throat> Even your administration has to go through an environmental review and it's typically exempt, okay? It's a one-page review. Um, you go through, you select, hey, this is admin, you're signing it, you move on. Categorically excluded, not subject to, this would be an activity such as a home buyer program, okay? Uh, you're really not doing anything that's construction related. It's more of, admin, you know, it's paperwork, but it does involve some review of the property. So that would be an example of a home buyer. <clears throat> Categorically ex excluded, subject to, once you get to this level on down, you are required to do a request for release of funds. Okay, and we'll talk about that in one of the upcoming slides. But, so when we talk about categorically excluded subject to, it could be housing rehab, okay? That's an example of, of that category. We also look at an environmental assessment. EA could be something like um, a substantial rehab on a community center, okay? Uh, maybe we're adding uh, some square footage and we're renovating, uh, maybe we're completely renovating a park, that might be an environmental assessment. <clears throat> environmental impact statement, that's something that, <coughs> excuse me, I'm losing my voice, um, could be something like construction of, uh, you know, when we talk about disaster recovery, we're reconstructing a hundred units. Um, that might trigger an environmental impact statement, especially when we have mitigation measures or substantial mitigation measures that have to be incorporated into the environmental review. <clears throat> um, you must maintain written record of compliance with all applicable requirements, and this is what we call the environmental review record, okay? Um, note that any time that you have any legal challenges to your project, this is where they're going to approach it from, the environmental review process. Um, and because of that, it's also important that you note that it's not just the NEPA review. You better also be complying with your own state or local environmental review requirements, okay? We in California have CEQA, California Environmental Quality Act, and so when we do activities, we actually have to go through both environmental review processes, okay? And they actually mirror themselves in many ways, although the California one is actually stricter, has more things that we look into. Um, but we have to comply with both because if for some reason we get challenged and we didn't do the state one, we only did the NEPA, they can challenge us on this, the fact that we didn't do the state version, okay? So make sure that you're, you're doing both. Um, your ER should contain all documents, project descriptions, maps, pictures, etc. Uh, there's forms that must be included and checklists, which are the um, CEST, CENST. There are forms that are available to you on HUD's website. <coughs> resource HUD, uh, uh, the HUD Resource Exchange on the Environmental Review website. On the bottom right-hand corner, you'll see all of the forms there. Okay. How many of you are familiar with HEROES? Are you using HEROES? Fantastic. So the idea is that we're all going to move to 
uh, a web-based environmental review system. That way we're all going to be consistent. Um, and it allows your public to be able to see your environmental review. They don't have to have any specific password to access the system, to access the, the um, review for those particular projects. Okay? Um, it's a great little tool. It's not mandatory at this point. Environmental notices, make sure that you're publishing notices in your newspaper, depending on the level of review, will determine the number of days that it has to be published. Um, publish in the newspaper of general circulation. You can also post in a prominent public place and there's specific requirements. You should review the, the um, regulations to see where it has to be posted if you're gonna do it on site. Uh, Important to note that floodplains wetland notices must be published. You can't post it on uh, the actual site. Send copies of your notices to EPA, SHPO, and other agencies uh, and interested persons. Quite often you as the, the grantee, the city will receive um, requests from individuals who want to be notified whenever there is an environmental review. Uh, make sure that they are receiving your environmental reviews, okay? And because these things have to be published, uh, plan ahead, okay? This is something that happens all the time. We're ready to issue the contract. Oh, is environmental review done? Oh, no, you know, we have to go through this process. And now you're trying to, you know, buy time to, before you issue that, that contract. So plan ahead. It's very important. I always recommend to grantees that the second your action plan has been adopted by you know, your city council or whoever it may be and you're now submitting it into HUD, to HUD, that's a great time to start your environmental review. Okay? For uh, projects that require a um, CEST or an environmental assessment or EIS, environmental impact statement level of environmental review, you must submit a request for release of funds, or Form 7015.15, okay? We just call it an RROF, Request for Release of Funds, okay? Uh, it must be submitted to HUD, the HUD field office. HUD will approve and release the funds uh, with authority to release grant funds uh, after a 15-day uh, public comment period. So once your comment period has ended and you now have submitted your request, they start the 15-day period. Best practice. <clears throat> what I do <clears throat> is I contact my um, field office, environmental review officer, and I say, we're submitting this request, and I also am letting my uh, rep know, we're submitting this request on Friday. It's Wednesday today. But I'm giving you a copy of the notice. I'm giving you, emailing you a copy of the request for release of funds. It will actually arrive to you on Friday, but we're giving you a heads up so that you can prepare for it. Because we want to make sure that at the end of the 15-day period, and that they start their 15-day review period as soon as possible, okay? So <clears throat> after, after they can start the 15-day review period. So um, this way you're, you're being more efficient and effective and you, as soon as that 15 day period is up, we're calling our rep. Uh, hey, it's 15 days. Uh, can you, you know, just a reminder that, you know, we want to make sure that we get that release of funds, which is, okay, uh, the 7, 715-6. Um, and it goes a lot smoother, okay? So that, sometimes that communication does, does help. Um, implement or process that, that uh, request for release of funds uh, a lot quicker. Davis Bacon. How many of you are responsible for Davis Bacon? Okay. Kind of like public service agencies. Contractors are great at what they do, right? Is, is paperwork one of them? No. No. Is math one of them? They know the Pythagorean theorem because all the buildings are perfectly square, right? They, they do. But 
they can't add fringe benefits and, and salaries if their life depended on it, right? Um, so what Davis-Bacon is, uh, it applies to construction contracts over $2,000 involving CDBG funds. It requires that workers, laborers, per, individuals who are working on a particular construction project that's funded with CDBG funds are paid at least minimum wages as determined by the Department of Labor. Okay? These wage determinations are available online and so there's a, a pretty lengthy process to uh, Davis-Bacon um, starting with you know, making sure that the bid documents contain all the proper forms, language to comply with the Davis-Bacon requirements. That includes the wage determination that's active at the time. That also includes um, the type, I'm sorry, the type of wage determination applicable to that project, whether it's a building, residential, highway, or heavy, okay? Um, so there's a process that takes place. There are some exceptions. So if you are doing housing of seven or fewer units under one owner, it is exempt, okay? It does not apply to acquisition of property. And as we learned yesterday, it may not apply to demolition as well as it might, okay? Uh, correct, so what you, and glad you brought that up because it's not even on the slide. So make sure that you're also complying with your state wage requirements, okay? And so his point is that their state wage requirements are higher or pretty much equal to I just finally had one instance of Davis Bacon was higher than co contract rent. Okay. Yeah. So the rule is you you use Davis Bacon, and if your state wage is higher, then you're going to take the higher of the two. You always take the higher of the two. Okay. Wage decisions uh, need to be needed to determine what prevailing wages. Again, you want to make sure you're using the right classification. Uh, prime contractor must post that wage decision on site. All contractors need to use the right type of classification. You are required to do a 10-day call. You guys know what the 10-day call is? So 10 days before the bid opening, you need to go back and check and make sure that if that wage determination is, has changed, you issue an addendum to the contractor saying, all the bid hold, the plan holders and say, hey, by the way, the wage determination has changed. Here's the new class, the wage determination number, okay? So it's important that you make that 10-day call, and then that actual wage classification is the, the wages of record. That's, that's the official one, okay? I'm sorry, 10 days before the notice to proceed? 10 days before the bid opening date. Before the bid opening. Yes. Yeah, that way contractors can you know, make adjustments as necessary, but it must be formally noticed to everybody, okay? So normally you do it through an addendum. Um, HUD guide provides definitions for key terms, so these are important. Uh, apprentice is, is one of the most important ones because quite often there are local apprentice programs that are not necessarily certified and the contractors will argue with you that they are an apprentice and you're saying they're not through a certified um, apprentice program with normally it's through the state okay so it's important that you look at those definitions to make sure that they are doing it correctly that they're using the right apprenticeship documentations Okay, so all bids and contracts are subject to Davis, that are subject to Davis-Bacon must contain standard clauses and there are a number of clauses and forms that need to be included with the documents. Make sure that they're all included. Hold a pre-construction conference to review the requirements with a contractor. This is the best thing that you can do and it's my understanding that it's no longer required uh, but I, if there's one thing that you should do is that pre-construction meeting. It's where you have an opportunity to lay down the ground rules, right? 
here's what we expect. We want certified payrolls once a week. We, you need to post it here. You need to do that there. We're going to come out and interview employees. Uh, here's what we're, how we're going to do this. You know, you cannot interfere. Let your employees know we will be out here. So you're, let, you're basically outlining everything that is going to be required. Okay. Now, I will tell you that when you have that pre-construction meeting, this is what the contractor is going to be doing. Yep. 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 Oh, yes. 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 Very first certified payroll. Where's the certified payroll? Oh, we're supposed to submit it? Yes. Every week. Oh, I, I didn't know that. You know. So, yeah, it's we, our best practice is we actually will have a list. It's a punch list. Everything that we go through, okay? We have them sign. And we give them a copy and we say, read it again when you get back to the office because we know that, you know, probably half of it just went over your head. It is a good practice. Uh, and, you know, we can go back and point at it and say, yeah, you signed this. You said you understood it. Sure. Yeah. As much as you can do during that pre-construction meeting, that's, that's, that's great. Um, contract administrator enforces requirements and provides information to the contractor. It's important. You, have, you must be reviewing every certified payroll, okay, to make sure that everything's complete, that the statement of compliance has been signed, and then, you know, sometimes it's on the back of the form, sometimes it's separate. Um, but make sure that they are in compliance. So, number one, you may get somebody from HUD, um, from the department that oversees Davis Bacon, to see if you complied with the requirements. They'll monitor your projects, okay? I mean, we, we work with a lot of grantees in, in Southern California, and at least once a year, one of our grantees is getting monitored for Davis Bacon. Number two, don't be surprised if a labor union is knocking on your door saying, based on the Freedom of uh, Information Act, we want to see copies of those documents. Yeah. Because they want to make sure that uh, these individuals are being paid those wages. You must comply with other labor laws, uh, Contract Work Hour Safety Standards Act, uh, the Copeland Anti-Kickback Act and Fair Labor Standards Act, okay? And these should all be included in your agreements as well, that the contractor is going to comply with all of these requirements, okay? Let's move on to the federal uh, lead requirements. We basically are looking at three separate rules. The lead safe housing rule, which is for HUD-assisted residential properties. We look at the disclosure rule, which applies to all residential properties. And three, we look at renovation, repair, and paint rule, which applies to all residential property and non-residential, and this is important, child-occupied facilities, okay? Be the reason I bring that up is quite often, we find that we're, f we're providing some financial assistance, some CDBG funds, for a daycare facility to be repaired, right? Carpeting replaced, painted, and you know what? This rule applies to that facility, okay? So don't, don't forget that. It's not just your, your housing rehab if you are actually doing any improvements to a, a child-occupied facility, okay? So, the Lead Safe Housing Rule, which became effective uh, on September 15, 2000, uh, applies to all pre-1978 uh, owner and rental properties. Pre-78, because that's when the paint companies were prohibited from uh, having paint that had lead in it, okay? Um, the Language for the lead safe housing rule can be found at 24 CFR part 35. And we actually are looking at the level uh, of evaluation and treatment 
Um, and it all depends on two things, the type of assistance and the level of assistance, okay? And we'll go through, through both in the next couple of slides. Note that the lower of the per unit rehab hard cost or the per unit federal assistance is what you will use to determine the level of assistance category that you're going to use when going through your lead, lead uh, safe housing rule, okay? So as an example, if you were doing 10 units and the total cost was $100,000, you can actually do a per unit, and what would that be? $10,000, right? Okay. So when we look at the evaluation, that's the first thing we're going to look at. Evaluation of the activity depends on the level of assistance. When you look at the level of assistance is going to be less than $5,000, then your evaluation should basically can be limited to just a paint test. Okay. If your project is over $5,000, you must also do a risk assessment. That risk assessment must be provided to the homeowner. Uh, a copy of that risk assessment must be provided to the homeowner along with the test within 15 days of receiving that risk assessment, okay? And it's not on this slide, it's not actually on in anywhere on this presentation, but you must also provide them with the brochure when they apply that it's called Renovate Right. Okay, you're all familiar with that? If you don't have it, it's available on, uh, in the internet. And if for some reason you have communities that are non-English speaking, they actually have it in how many different languages? Yeah, it's probably 30 languages that I remember, okay? So you'll ask the applicant, you know, would you like it in English? Would you like it in Spanish? Would you like it in um, Chinese? W whatever it may be, okay? And it is available. So make that document, that Renovate Right brochure available to them and make sure that they sign an acknowledgement that they receive that. Because when you look at the residential rehab checklist, the HUD monitoring checklist, that's one of the things that they're looking for. Um, so we talked about the risk assessment, providing the copy of the risk assessment to, to the homeowner within 15 days, okay? And also not in here, notification to the, the homeowner is very important, but it's not on these slides, and that's once the... If, if there's work done and there's a clearance test that's complete, that has to be completed, that a copy of the clearance test is also provided to the homeowners, okay? Same concept, 15 days, okay? Um, so you can, uh, alternatively, uh, with presumption, provide a notice of presumption within 15 days to the occupant. So if you're, you're presuming that there is lead-based paint and that goes into the, the regulation um, where you can actually just do a presumption that there's going to be paint and then handle it that way, okay? So we talked about the evaluation in the prior slide. Now we're going to talk about the treatment based on assistance level. So what is it that you have to do now that you know how much you are going to assist the, the homeowner? So if it's less than or equal to 5,000, you're going to repair surfaces to be disturbed. You're going to use safe work practices and a certified renovation firm. If it's between 5,000 and 25,000, you'll use interim controls of lead hazards, safe work practices, and certified renovation firm. If it's over 25,000, then you're going to abate all lead hazards, and you will use a certified abatement firm, okay? So that's, you have these, these magic numbers, 5,000 between 5 to 25 and over 25. And depending on the level uh, of assistance that you're providing will determine what, what you are required to do. 
And you notice that she indicated her program goes up to 5,000 because of these requirements. Likewise, we work with a lot of grantees that have a limit of 25,000 for that same purpose. Because once you get to this level, it could get very expensive, okay? So look at your design and see what your, your goals are. By the way, you can also set up a program, an activity that is just for addressing lead-based pain, okay? And many communities do that. Um, and I, I think it's a great program. You know, it's a way of, of making sure to bring your housing stock up to date and alleviate it from all the lead-based paint uh, contamination that we have in, in our older housing stock, okay? When is the URA trigger, Uniform Relocation Act? And again, we're not gonna get into much detail. We've got a couple of slides on this. It's triggered when real property is acquired or persons displaced as direct result of three things, acquisition, demolition, and rehabilitation for a federally funded project. So there's, there's one thing that, you know, in our firm we have people who are specialists in Davis-Bacon, we have people who are specialists in financial, we have a variety. There's one thing that we don't do because it's a very technical and complicated subject matter. And if you don't do it right, do you guys, you guys do it or why are you? Uh, breaking news? <laughs> um, it is very complicated to do. Uh, and if you don't do it right, uh, you're going to be paying lots of money for somebody that was not compensated correctly or not compensated at all that should have been compensated, okay? So, you know, for us, you know, we work with specialists who know relocation law. Um, and even in California, we have additional relocation requirements. So, um, what I want you to understand here is that it's a very complicated subject matter and make sure that if, if you're going to approach it and do it yourself, make sure you know what you're doing, that you have a process in place, you have a relocation uh, plan, policies and procedures, how it works, how you notify, because there's a lot of, there's a, a, a lot of things involved in relocation, okay? And so when we talk about you know, who it applies to, it applies to government agencies, private organizations and others. Uh, it's triggered if any federal assistance in a, in, is in any phase of the project, not just the phase that you're working on right now, okay? Could be that there's a future phase that, that's involved. Um, it applies to virtually all federal programs, including CDBG and, and the 108 program, whether it's a grant, loan, and any other contributions. You like that picture? This is Chris Kizzy and his fraternity brothers. <laughs> There's Chris right there. Ah, just kidding. <laughs> I don't know where they got this picture, but it's a great picture. So, who is a displaced person? It could be family, individual, businesses, okay? Businesses can be displaced, farms can be displaced, or a nonprofit. Uh, that moves permanently as a direct result of a federally assisted project, okay? Very important, yes? Can I just add, it's not just when you're relocating the family. If you're doing an infrastructure project and you need right-of-way, mm -hmm. you also have to follow the URA. So you may, you know, you don't always know if you're in a URA situation. You have to kind of keep looking. Because yeah. and temporary. Right. Correct. Correct. Good point. Yeah. Yeah, it's a very complicated subject matter, as I as I indicated. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So, uh, residentially displaced persons are eligible to receive advisory services. Uh, minimum ninety day notice to vacate. 
uh, replacement uh, housing payments, possibly housing of last resort, and moving expense uh, payments. So as you can see, they're entitled to quite a few things, okay? And uh, if, you, again, you don't do it right, you may be on the hook for more than just that, okay? Yeah. Uh, then we talk about non-residentially displaced persons, what they're eligible for. Many of the things are, are basically the same as um, the residential, with some exceptions, but this is basically the, the list, okay? Most of you are working with housing rehab and could possibly have to do a temporary relocation, right? You find mold or when you're doing your lead-based paint, you find out that there's contamination and in order for them to address the lead-based paint, they're having to move some people out uh, temporarily. So when you do that, um, you're looking at providing them with advisory services, temporary relocation assistance, and it can exceed one year period of time. And it remains in, and by the way, I don't know why they use DSS, but it's decent, sanitary, and safe, okay? Uh, suitable, affordable unit. If no rent increase, unit is deemed affordable. And I love this picture, by the way. It says, La Siesta Motel, okay? Yes. And if you have a rehab program and it's a voluntary program and people know up front, you know, you will need to vacate temporarily. That's a condition of accepting this assistance. Do you, I wouldn't think you would have to go through all this um, paying for, for all that up there. To bring to that. Right. And, and there is uh, some language as it relates to exactly voluntary because they voluntarily applied to the program. But you really do, so what, what we've done um, is we have brought in a relocation expert and we develop policies and procedures for our rehab programs to make sure that if a certain situation occurs that the staff knows what they need to do. Oh, we found this. But because we have this situation, here's the notices we have to provide, or here's the authorization we need to provide, and here's what we're, we can pay, you know, and here's what we are responsible for. Um, because again, it gets really, uh, I, honestly, I, I don't know enough about relocation to give you a, a, a good answer. Um, Program where they have a choice. The voluntary okay. persons that we're rehabbing, they have a choice for either to have the uh, temporary housing stay or the ex moving expenses, such as the storage unit cost for the, for them. So they get to choose between the two. And you okay. pay for it? Well, we do. One of the, I mean, the uh, neighboring city does one or the other. <laughs> <laughs> document the choice and then you know so when people see this uh, <laughs> if they if they post this on um, on the HUD resource exchange everybody's gonna be wondering who in the heck is that neighboring city <laughs> the neighboring city got a lot of play that day okay, okay. yeah and and again I apologize that I, I don't have the the answer for you okay there's other neighboring cities that don't <laughs> offer assistance for a temporary relocation. Right. It's not a requirement in a voluntary program. Correct. Right. It's different if it's a rental situation, you're going into rehab a rental unit. Right. Or they don't have a choice. Right. Yeah. Right. And, and I, I believe that that's correct, but I can't with any certainty, so I don't want to say yes. Okay, um, for purchasers, so when we look at home buyer programs, uh, purchases by the grantee, nonprofits uh, with federal assistance, for profits with federal assistance, agent or consultation acting on behalf of the grantee, and you want to be real careful right there because sometimes agents or consultants acting on behalf of the grantee 
may go out there and say things and do things that will violate the requirements and suddenly now you're on the hook for those things because they were acting on your behalf, okay? So, very important. Home buyers with federal down payment assistance, okay? So, that's your down payment assistance program. Section 104D, we kind of touched on this yesterday with the disaster recovery program. So, when we talk about Section 104D, it's for uh, it triggered only when CDBG or home funds are used for a project when there's a demolition or there's a conversion of a unit that is currently occupied by a low and moderate income person, okay, or persons. 104D basically addresses relocation assistance um, and one-for-one -one replacement um, of low and moderate income housing stock, okay? Adhere to laws and regulations for the Architectural Barriers Act, Americans with Disabilities Act, Section 504 and Fair Housing Act, okay? And by the way, since I have, uh, let's go back to one of these laws. Do, 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 do. do you all comply with Title VI? Do you all have LEP plans? LEP plans. Limited English proficiency plan. Okay. Just want to make sure because quite we're recently I've run into some grantees and I'm saying, do you meet Title VI? And they're like, what? Yeah, LEP, do you do that? And they don't. So it's, it's something that they're now checking on. Okay. Section 504 makes it unlawful to discriminate based on disability in HUD funded housing programs. Uh, recipient must take steps to ensure accessibility of communication. So that's, you know, whether it's sign language, whether it's uh, other types of even braille, any type of communication that's necessary. Prohibits against employment discrimination, which is why when they went out to monitor you, they were talking to your um, um, human resources department, right? They want to make sure that empl no employment discrimination is happening. Ensure program accessibility, housing and non-housing. Application of 504 to housing. If you are doing housing, you want to make sure that if it's new construction with five or more units uh, and substantial rehab of multifamily with more than 15 units, it actually applies. So you have to do, if you're doing substantial rehab, okay, which is more than 75% of replacement cost, if 5% of the unit's accessible for persons with mobility impairments, okay? So you now have to go in and possibly remodel some of your units so that they, are, they do become accessible. An additional 2% of the units accessible for persons with hearing or vision impairment. You want to make sure under Section 504 that the facility can be approached, entered, used by persons with physical handicaps, okay? Several options for improving uh, program access. And I know that there was a grantee that I work with that was monitored by FHEO and there was a ramp literally that was half an inch off over a 20-foot length and they had to go in and replace it, okay? So, you know, you might want to be proactive and, and have somebody come out and do the analysis and make sure that all your facilities are accessible because you can use CDBG funds to make them compliant, okay? Absolutely, absolutely. Okay. Equal opportunity, you want to make sure that you're in compliance with all of these uh, laws and regulations and acts and not only you, but you're passing them along to all of your subrecipients and anybody that you enter into an agreement with. Okay, provide equal opportunity and provisions to services, facilities, improvements, um, all CDBG related employment, procurement and contracts. Keep records, we can't emphasize that enough. Uh, maintain accurate and complete records of everything you do, okay? Section three, section three applies. It requires training, employment, and contracting opportunities for low-income residents and businesses, uh, business owners of 
the project area for programs involving construction or rehab. And that actually applies if you are a grantee that receives more than $200,000 in funds and that contract is $100,000 or more. Section 3 applies. And basically, it's a, it's a good faith effort that you are going to reach out to uh, either you're trying to recruit Section 3 contractors to do work. And by the way, there is now a website that lists Section 3 contractors, okay? So there's no reason why you can't recruit Section 3 contractors for your projects, okay?